Imagine, just for a moment, that the world is ruled by a small group who control everything of importance. Governments, big business, and the media. It sounds somewhat unlikely, but now imagine that this all-powerful group comes from another planet, and our rulers are in league with them. Now, that sounds really, really unlikely, and yet plenty of apparently sane people are convinced that it's true. They own you. They own your emotions, and you basically belong to them. I think they would kill people, and that's on the record too. If you can control someone's sense of reality, then the human collective mind is putty in your hands. So, has someone been handing out space cakes? Or is this the biggest alien conspiracy of all? July the 16th, 1945, the day the atom bomb exploded. Everyone agrees that this was an historic day. But some people believe it was also the day an alien conspiracy to take over our planet began. You see, apparently, this was an event which didn't just get noticed here on Earth. The shockwaves were felt across our galaxy and beyond. Ever since the uh, UFO phenomenon sort of exploded into public consciousness in the, in the mid-late 1940s, uh, people have wondered, you know, why now, why now? And, and of course, the first answer people came upon was that, well, now we have the atomic bomb. When we set off the first atomic bomb, there was such energy released that that probably created ripples throughout our solar system, perhaps throughout the galaxy. And other advanced races out there kind of did a double take and went, oh my God, the kids have found the matches. It's true that it wasn't long after the nuclear blasts in the late 1940s that the first witness reports of UFOs began. I think it was from out of space, but friendly. According to the theory, these UFOs were alien craft who had arrived as an advanced guard. They were soon making contact with our rulers and negotiating terms. And if the theory is to be believed, an international conspiracy then began to hide any evidence of this contact. It's a cover-up which is still in full swing, or so some believe. Meet Peter Gersten, an all-American criminal lawyer. When he's not suing people and doing all the other things lawyers do, He's taking on the US government. And that's because ever since he was a boy, Gersten's been fascinated by UFOs. Some people would just go out and buy a toy ray gun, but not Gersten. Instead, he has spent much of his career trying to prove that the American government has been hiding its extensive knowledge of aliens and alien contact. I was the first and only attorney ever to bring any lawsuits against the US government for UFO-related documents that actually made it into court. His dogged persistence and knowledge of the American freedom of information laws eventually led to the release of hundreds of previously unseen documents. I must have brought about 10 lawsuits. Even when they release documents, they've always withheld something within those documents. This affidavit is a perfect example. Half the affidavit is blacked out. If UFOs do not pose a threat, if UFOs do not represent an advanced technology, then why is this all deleted? Why indeed? He says these documents reveal the American government's obsession with the UFO phenomenon, which began during the 1940s and 50s. They reveal the existence of government committees, which were initially set up to investigate UFOs. But all along, the existence of these organizations was denied, until finally they were all closed down, one by one. Despite the fact that governments kept telling the public there was no such thing as aliens, the aliens themselves didn't seem to be getting the message. Because according to Gersten, they just kept flying their spaceships through our skies. 
One case which has been cited by many as proof of a vast conspiracy conveniently happened in Gersten's backyard in Phoenix, Arizona. Unidentified flying objects over the valley. A triangular shaped object. What was in the sky last night? The Phoenix lights lasted anywhere from an hour, an hour and a half to two hours, and there's never been a major investigation to determine what that was. What is it? I don't know. About 10.30 at night, there were about seven lights that had a distinct formation that just stayed over Phoenix in a triangular pattern and then left. And uh, it's amazing to me that something um, can appear so brazenly over a major metropolitan area and not be fully investigated. The story gripped the local media, but the official response was some kind of military flares. They had a number of leftover flares on the aircraft, and each aircraft had to get rid of them because the rules prohibit the aircraft from landing with flares on board. Gersten returned to the courtroom, but even he couldn't prize an explanation out of the authorities. The Freedom of Information Act is, is totally impotent. All they have to do is a reasonable search. And they say they did a reasonable search, we couldn't find anything, and the court goes along with that. So, is Gersten onto something, or does he just need to get out more? To really get to the bottom of what the government might be hiding, we need an insider. One who's seen some alien evidence with their own eyes. If you're involved in something like this, who do you talk to? You can't tell your family. You can't tell your closest friend. Now the most convincing evidence that aliens have landed and those in power know about it would naturally be the sight of, well, an alien hanging out with the rich and powerful. Being driven around in a limousine or being photographed with celebrities. Unfortunately, the absence of anything like this means believers had to rely on something less convincing. Hearsay, and there's certainly been plenty of that. I glanced up and there were three flying saucers at an altitude of 350 feet. No one disagrees that in the 1940s there were lots of unidentified flying object sightings. Even the skeptics agree there have been a lot of these sightings, but they put that down to paranoia. What's this all about? What's everybody running from? It's the end of everything. What do you mean? There was, after all, something called the Cold War going on. When the West and the Soviets confronted each other with secret weapons, spy planes and various other military thingamajigs. The skeptics put UFO reports down to all of this. Nick Pope for example, conducted an official British investigation into UFO claims. And let's just say he's not convinced. Nothing so far um, tends to give rise to any suggestion that extraterrestrials have visited the Earth. But it's often suggested that there's a huge conspiracy here and that the government somehow covering up the truth about UFOs. Well, having headed the UFO project uh, for four years, I can categorically say there's no truth in that whatsoever. For believers, though, the more governments deny, the deeper the cover-up must be. And instead, they turn to people who have claimed to have seen for themselves evidence of an alien plot. Some of these witnesses say they even saw evidence of an elaborate government cover-up. You know, things like alien craft, soldiers picking over it, and aliens. Here's someone who says he saw exactly that. Clifford Stone spent over 20 years in the American Army. For most of that time, he had a desk job. But that's not to say nothing interesting happened to him. Because according to Stone, he was drafted into a top secret operation. Its purpose, to retrieve downed Soviet satellites. I was involved in the activities that would recover. Crashes, debris thereof, those operations were known as Project Moondust and Operation Blue Flight. Those two projects dealt with two things, 
the recovery of objects of unknown origin or objects that survived re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. Most of the recoveries were routine. But then in 1969, says Stone, his team were asked to investigate something that was very weird indeed. During that time, we got a call and they stated that they needed us to put some people together because they had a plane or something that went down not too far from where we were at. When we got there, a person that I would later always call the colonel, he was there and he came up and he told me, he says, uh, specialist, I need you to go ahead, take your Geiger counter, and I want you to take Geiger counter readings and call them back to us. Well, I was asking, well, what is it? And he went ahead and said, it's some type of Soviet spacecraft that crashed. He says, now, if you get there and you see anything unusual, you need to keep in mind that the Soviets put monkeys, just like we do, in their craft. And as a result of that, if you see any bodies, don't worry about it. It will be monkeys. This was nothing that I had ever seen. I knew it wasn't our craft. I knew it wasn't the Soviet craft. Uh, as soon as I got to the place where I could look down, I could see where there was a little kidney-shaped door that opened on the side, and I saw one of the creatures lying out there. Uh, I went ahead and told him I needed an officer. I needed an officer to come up there, that this wasn't right. I also said, this is no damn monkey. Ever since he left the army, Stone says he's been trying to get the American government to admit to what he says he saw. The Defense Department, though, are still refusing to corroborate his story. Whatever the truth, he does seem to believe passionately in what he's saying. But it's worth remembering that people claim to have seen an awful lot of strange things. Take, for example, the family in Slovakia in 1990 who claimed to have been visited by the Virgin Mary. Or the hundreds of worshippers at a Hindu temple in the UK who swore they saw a statue drinking milk. And in Michigan, dozens of folks said they'd seen weird demonic children with melons for heads. Belief. It's a funny thing. But if by some chance Clifford Stone is telling the truth, it raises an obvious question. Why, oh why, would governments hide their encounters with aliens? What have they got to gain? Some people think the answer lies in technology, and we're not talking ringtones. Richard Dolan is a writer who has been investigating government conspiracies for over 10 years. Whether you believe that, that the UFOs are ours or alien, there's certainly something that's showing non-fossil fuel related transport. You know, I've spoken to, to hundreds of people who said, yeah, this object stopped over my head and, and took off like a bullet silently. Well, this is not 100 octane petroleum here. This is something far beyond. So the question is, what is it? So if alien craft are using some advanced technology we don't know about, what might it be? We were hoping you'd ask. Tom Vallone is one of a small band of scientists working on various theories that could explain how alien craft travel, if indeed they do, intergalactically. These flying saucers travel thousands of miles in seconds. Vallone believes aliens can travel light years through space because they've come up with a source of energy that never runs out. Which means it's a lot cheaper and more reliable than the stuff you'd find on your local forecourt. Cool. We couldn't possibly imagine that UFOs would be burning rocket fuel. You can't even get to Mars today with rocket fuel. So we have to accept the fact that if there are vehicles that can travel interplanetary and perhaps interstellar, uh, they have to use an onboard fuel source that is converting ambient energy or have such a con concentrated form of energy that it can survive over light years of travel. Right. 
and how might they do that? The current UFO research points to uh, many different technologies that can be used for free energy and what we call anti-gravity propulsion. Solving the problem of anti-gravity has flummoxed the greatest minds in physics, but Tom has spent many months locked in his garden shed trying to figure it out. He's even built a little replica UFO. One UFO contact he reported uh, a disk the size of the UFO that had magnets on the outer edge. And so here we actually have a disk that has magnets on the outer edge that perhaps may be powered by some means that involve permanent magnets or some arrangement of permanent magnets. According to Vallone, the separate halves of UFOs might contra-rotate to create energy that can be harnessed to power the spaceship. The beauty of this energy is that it comes out of nowhere. You don't need to do anything so last century as actually burn fuel. In fact, it's like you're creating it out of thin air. You can see why Tom is still puzzling over it, can't you? According to the alien conspiracy theory, when the extraterrestrials brought this energy to Earth, a lot of very powerful humans got very annoyed. For my sunshine, my sunshine. Some people, like journalist Jim Mars, think those in power didn't want such limitless energy to become widely available. The spoil sports. Think of the ramifications. If a whole new energy technology was to come along that would just overnight replace gas and oil. The oil industry would collapse, the Middle East would collapse, the the whole uh, car industry would collapse. Uh, you know, I mean, it would be a severe upheaval in our society. In a world economy dominated by oil, Mars says this new kind of new energy would undermine powerful business interests. See, these folks, they don't care if we know there's aliens out there. What they care about is if we know there's aliens, then we know there's alternative technologies. And this could upset their monopolies. But Mars goes even further. He says the government and the powers that be started covering all this up even before the 1940s. We're on the way to Aurora, Texas, where uh, legend has it that a spaceship crashed in 1897. This is the uh, Texas Historical Commission, the state marker that I was telling you about. And uh, it's the, the oldest known graves here, uh, early 1860s. This site's also well known because of the legend that a spaceship crashed nearby in 1897, and the pilot killed in the crash was buried here. And uh, the only caveat, of course, is the word legend. Okay, right up here under this oak tree is where the grave site is, but there's no marker, so I guess I'm one of the last people in the world to know precisely where the grave is. And now that you know, I guess you'll have to be killed. <laughs> it was right here. Someone stole the marker back in 1973. We figured the government did it. And I have a reason to believe that's true because uh, not too long back, I met a woman who grew up around here by the cemetery. And she said uh, that she had encountered federal officers in this cemetery. And I said, oh, yeah, that was probably back in... 73, and she said, no, this is back in the 50s when I was a little girl. Jim's experience in Texas led him, he says, to compare notes with others across America, and he began to detect a pattern to the cover-ups. Ah, you were wondering how long it would take to get to the men in black? Well, here they come. If someone has a UFO-connected experience, then sometimes they are visited by strange men in black suits who, uh, number one, ask them, what exactly did you experience? And number two, tell them, if you know what's good for you, you won't talk about this. Now, let's just get this story right. According to Mars and many others, there's been a worldwide conspiracy to cover up contact with aliens because governments don't want to reveal the technology they learned from these extraterrestrials. 
But does that make any sense? Wouldn't the governments or the oil companies just license this advanced technology and sell it? And anyway, if they wanted to cover up contact with aliens, you'd think they'd remember to take away that sign. But since all the people involved are long dead, there's no way we can ever know for sure if it really happened. What we really need to do is meet one of these men in black for ourselves. Well, guess what? We found someone who said he worked for a top secret military organization. And his job was to run part of the official cover-up. Funnily enough, he wanted to remain anonymous. I was trained by the Central Intelligence Agency and the Defense Intelligence Agency. During my DIA career, I investigated unidentified flying object sightings throughout the southwestern part of the United States. We did conduct counterintelligence operations against people that were close to obtaining the truth about classified programs. Some might call the operations disinformation, but whatever you call it, it was a legitimate form of putting the wrong people away from the classified programs. This alleged secret agent wouldn't tell us exactly why the military wanted to hide their contact with aliens. Although there were dark hints of a military alien alliance, and he was happy to admit he'd met many an alien in his time. They're uh, about four foot, and they have the classical large eyes. They, they come from a planet with a, apparently a very bright sun, so they have uh, double eyelids, uh, have no ears per se, just have an opening on each side of their head, uh, same as nose, mouth, no teeth. Uh, simple internal organs, heart and lungs, basically the same organ, simple digestive system. I'm not going to discuss that. There's a, there's a lot of information I wish I didn't know. So there you go. A secret agent who positively wanted to be interviewed. He refused to give us any evidence to back up his claims and we couldn't find any either. But if he did what he says he did, how does he sleep at night? I don't have any problem with my conscience, no. I, I, the, everything I did in a government service, uh, the disinformation uh, in this area, uh, was all legitimate. It's a, it's a, it's a, a sanctioned operations that I was told to do. I did my job and I did it well. These guys, they're unofficial. They don't exist within the official framework of our society. These uh, agents charged with, with studying UFO phenomena and so forth. They're outside. Okay. Maybe Agent X is telling the truth and he's a man in black. If so, we've stumbled on a scoop. So when did the cover-up begin? Maybe aliens didn't first land in the 1940s or even in the 1890s. Because maybe just maybe, aliens have been here for a long time, and when we say a long time, we mean a very long time. They've been running the world since the year dot, and they've kept it very quiet indeed. People want to laugh and say it's impossible. Well, please be my guest, I don't care. But if you're interested in what's happening in the world, this is a phenomenon that needs looking at, because there's something to look at. So, we've had top secret government committees investigating the presence of UFOs in our skies. We've had secret military operations to retrieve downed spaceships and their alien pilots. We've had sinister government agents terrorizing the public. But in terms of a conspiracy, this is just the tip of the alien iceberg. I woke up and mere inches in front of my face, there he was. And I was really freaked out. This is a very rare opportunity we're looking at. Implants are rare. Because according to some, the aliens have not only landed, they're actually running the world. What? Yes. Here's a man who believes it. David Icke. Ike regularly speaks to packed-out audiences, spooking them out with the full implications of his theory. 
The power that these guys I'm going to talk about in detail today use to manipulate, control and slaughter many of us, increasingly so, is only the power we give away every single day. He hasn't always been a full-time conspiracy theorist. In fact, he started as a soccer player and sports commentator on the BBC. But all along, something was troubling him. When I was a kid, I had this feeling. I couldn't put words to it. I had this feeling I had something to do. Um, and when I started being quite good at football and went into professional football, I thought, that must be what it is. But there was always... There was something missing. I couldn't put words to it. I felt unfulfilled. Ike looked at the world and there was something wrong with it. At first he couldn't work out what it was, but something under the surface was amiss. International poverty, global warming, the capitalist system. No, something deeper still. He became convinced that everything that was wrong with the world could be explained by one overarching idea. That a small ruthless elite had taken control of our planet. It's claimed it is made up of a highly secretive group of families who exercise absolute control over world politics and economics. Its name? The Illuminati. Well, the name Illuminati comes from the, the phrase uh, the Illuminated Ones, which is extremely appropriate because they are illuminated into knowledge that they keep from the rest of the people. Ike was convinced that these families were no ordinary power-crazed tyrannical elite. Oh, no. There was just one small detail which distinguished them from the rest of us. What I've done is ask the next question, which is, where did the Illuminati come from and uh, who controls them? And you go back into thousands of years BC and you start to pick up another common theme which is of um, interbreeding between humans and a non-human race. I am from another planet outside your galaxy. I'm sorry, I, I just don't understand. Ike claims thousands of years ago aliens arrived on Earth and probably interbred with the leading families of ancient primitive societies, creating alien-human hybrids. These hybrids and their descendants control the planet and everything on it. And if that wasn't scary enough, Ike says that they live in disguise amongst us, they live for hundreds of years and they eat human flesh. Nobody's perfect. And in case you've been wondering, their sacred symbol is the pyramid, which is why, according to Ike, it's no accident that pyramid-shaped buildings are found from Mexico and Peru to Egypt and ancient Babylon. And how do we know about these guys? Well, according to Ike, this most top secret of secret societies uses special codes to communicate, using their own sacred images of the pyramid. On the dollar bill, you have an ancient Illuminati symbol, which symbolizes perfectly what I'm talking about. It's the, uh, the pyramid um, structure, and at the top, you've got the all-seeing eye, the capstone of the pyramid, the illuminated ones, illuminated into knowledge they keep from the rest of the population. Now, quite why the most secretive beings on the planet use the least secretive place to communicate no one seems to know. Such details haven't stopped David Icke selling thousands of books, although there has been criticism of his use of the word Illuminati. The same term was used in the past by right-wing extremists to describe a worldwide conspiracy run by Marxists, Freemasons and Jews. And some have claimed that he is just tapping into old extreme paranoias. So who are the alien-human hybrids, and how would we spot one if we saw it? Well, apparently they include George Bush, Tony Blair, and even the Queen of England. And we thought she was just German. Apparently they are all descendants of the original alien hybrids. 
what you have in effect is the Illuminati families being the genetic representatives uh, on this planet of these serpent gods. Serpents? Yes, the aliens who came down to Earth long, long ago didn't look like the Queen of England. In fact, they were serpent, lizardy sorts. And even when they interbred, the old reptile bit just wouldn't disappear. Well, I think the, the answer to why reptiles is why not? Um, it's just a form through which people express themselves or entities consciousness expresses themselves. The Illuminati cover up their reptilian nature with a human disguise. But occasionally, though, the effort of hiding their slithery selves becomes too much, and the mask drops. Let me see you as you really are. People find it difficult to perceive of a two-legged reptilian entity with uh, what we would call an intelligent mind. Uh, but. I have talked to hundreds and hundreds of people all over the world, up into more than 40 countries researching this, um, who have told me the same basic recurring story of seeing people, often in positions of power, but not always, change from a human into a reptilian form and then, and then, and then go back again. Sometimes it's for a few seconds, sometimes it's for longer. Ike's theory has turned him into a superstar in the conspiracy world. But some more mainstream ufologists are skeptical about his theories. Having worked in the fields of public relations and communication, I just, I'm not sure that I'm going to win friends and influence people by calling the Queen Mother of England a 200-year-old reptilian cannibal. Whatever the uh, truth, there's no doubt that Ike has tapped into something which people have often felt, the sense that their lives and their society are not under their control. But it's arguable whether those fears are calmed by imagining the world is run by lizards. Ike's theory that lizards are in control has had one notable effect. Whereas 20 or 30 years ago, alien sightings tended to be all about little green men, alien sighting stories have now begun to change. Now lizard sightings are all the rage. Mona Kempka, for example, is a fan of Ike. She's read all his books. And rather coincidentally, she has also seen lizards. They come visiting. My name is Mona Kempka, I'm 55 years old. I've been a, a psychiatric nurse for 30 years. I've lived alone for the last 10 years. 12 years ago, Mona had her first reptilian experience. In 1994, a reptoid appeared in my living room. Six foot three, thin waist, giant muscular legs. This being could kill five men with a swat. I was asleep because I worked the night shift. And I woke up, and mere inches in front of my face, there he was. And I was really freaked out. I stood up in my bed screaming. He appeared to me for six seconds, and uh, I w was standing up in my bed screaming, then he vanished. And I just sat down in my bed, and I started laughing hysterically. It wasn't because I thought it was funny. I was just hysterical. I didn't know who to call. I thought even my own mother would not believe this, you know. So what's going on? Has Mona seen a reptoid alien, or does she just think she has? Or did the books she read by Ike play their part? I mean, I don't believe everything I read. I take it all in and try to make my own decisions. But David Ike's on the money. And I don't even know David Ike. I'm just telling you, I'm glad this man is gaining momentum in this country. What would help convince the rest of us would be if Mona or anyone, had found some physical evidence, say, a bit of old lizard skin lying around. Sadly, 
there was none. But that doesn't mean to say that there isn't any physical evidence of aliens and their dastardly attempts to control the world. Well, not if you believe this man. He says he's found it. We cannot make claims of some strange entity in the midst of the night or in broad daylight in some cases actually came and abducted you and did various things and so on without there being physical evidence of those claims. Daryl Sims' day job is as a private investigator in Texas. But he has another string to his bow. He spent the last few years working with people he says have been implanted with alien probes. Just a normal, everyday sort of guy then. Well, first of all, they're varied and very different. We found them in the eye, we found them in the feet, we found them as large as a walnut, an inch big, next to the heart of an abductee. We found them in all types of places, deep inside the brain, some of them as big as uh, as into your thumb, and then disappear within a year. Uh, what they are, uh, that's a good question. What they're for, that's a good question as well. Sim says he has extracted many of these implants and even agreed to show us a film of him doing exactly that. What you're actually seeing here is, a, is Patricia under hypnotic anesthesia. She has been given a series of suggestions. Each time she will see her move and relax even greater. She's getting ready for the surgical intervention that will take place where the surgery will be done on the foot. Here they're making this incision. This is a very rare opportunity we're looking at. Implants are rare. The surgery has taken over an hour. They can't find the object that they found so easily on x-ray. Here he is bringing the object out in a T-shaped formation. What they found in the, uh, the, the keratin was wrapped around these objects and it was very hard, very durable. It showed no signs of inflammatory response. In other words, this object was not treated by, your, by the body of Patricia, as an example, in any way as if it were a foreign object. Now, Daryl Sims has no medical background whatsoever, but he claims that the object that was removed from Patricia's body was designed to control her mind. Quite why they put it in her foot, though, is a whole different matter. But anyway, over to you, Daryl. My thinking is that uh, the side effects of these objects, it seems to us, based on preliminary findings, is that levels of serotonin, dopamine, neurotransmitters in effect, have been altered in some of these abductees. Now any neuropsychologist or neurophysiologist can tell you in a New York minute that anybody that controls your serotonin, dopamine, or potassium, anybody that controls these neurotransmitters, especially serotonin and dopamine, they own you. They own your emotions, and you basically belong to them. Daryl didn't allow us to do any tests on the little implant, so we can't say for sure what it was. And why a secretive alien could have been so easily outwitted by a Texan private investigator is anybody's guess. What we do know is that Daryl isn't entirely objective. I became aware of the uh alien entity uh, in 1952 at age three and a half in an, an abduction scenario. And then um, what really threw me into high gear into full-time investigations in this phenomena is my son got abducted at age six. Then at that point, for me, I could live with my problems with the abductions. Uh, but when you come after my children, now it's personal. Alien lizard gods feeding off our own mistrust and fear. Alien implants that control our minds. Powerful alien-human hybrid families that run our world. Blimey. But one question keeps nagging. If some people are seeing aliens, why aren't we all? Perhaps the answer, unnervingly, lies in modern science. People are starting to realize that, that the world is not just a little bit different to what they thought it was. It's actually nothing like they thought it was. We've come a long way in our understanding of the UFO phenomena, but we still don't have a definitive answer. In the 50s, the big question was, do they come from Mars or do they come from Venus? By the 90s and today, we're even more sophisticated, and the question today becomes, do they come from another dimension? 
Most skeptical, rational people will never believe that aliens control us and our planet without some conclusive evidence. But what if it was impossible to come up with evidence? Because the way we see the world is itself flawed. People ask me, understandably, if these reptilian and other entities exist, why don't we see them? Well, it's to do with frequency. For instance, if I turn this radio on, I can get a station. If I move the dial, suddenly I've got another radio station. Now, the one I've just moved from hasn't uh, ceased to uh, exist, ceased to broadcast, it's continuing to broadcast, but I'm not tuning into it anymore. And so what we are in this so-called physical reality is we're like radio sets that are tuned into a particular reality. These reptilian entities uh, and others appear to have the knowledge of how to move between dimensions. We are invisible, Adam Penner. You cannot see us. That's very simply what's going on. It's not some great mystery. It's actually very, very simple. According to David Icke, the aliens have mastered some new technology which allows them to move from our visible world to mysterious invisible dimensions. Convenient. Oh yes. But why stop there? It's equally possible to claim that a whole host of weird stuff is hiding out in hidden dimensions. Ghosts. Werewolves. Elvis. And they'd all be impossible to disprove. Surely this must rank as the weirdest alien cover-up theory of all. Well, not quite. Nick Bostrom is Professor of Philosophy at Oxford University, which means he's been doing an awful lot of thinking. The brain box that he is. We know a lot about what's before our noses, but the big picture, uh, people think they know, but they really don't. They just make it up. And Bostrom has been making up some cool theories of his own, and one of them's about aliens and computers. Now, 40 years ago, Earth computers looked like this. Today, they look like this. A tiny laptop now has more power than the biggest computers used to have. And our computers keep getting more powerful and quicker. Bostrom thinks, though, that all this is Stone Age compared to what alien computers can do. In fact, their computers might be so advanced that he thinks we might all be living in them. Just like the Matrix. So one of the things that a technologically mature civilization would have is enormous amounts of computing power. By using a millionth of its computing power for only one second, they can create a simulation of all human minds that have ever lived. And according to Bostrom, maybe virtual reality simulations would be so convincing that we might actually be living in one. So could we all be trapped in an alien PlayStation? We are almost certainly living in a computer simulation, meaning that all this world that we see around us, everything we experience and everything we do, takes place in a virtual simulated reality that is implemented and running on a computer built by some technologically extremely advanced civilization. I have come to feel that we live in a kind of matrix-like world. Uh, the question is, how far does this simulation go? I don't trust anything in this reality. I think it's an illusion. It's a holographic reality. It's the product of somebody's technology or something's technology. So anything is possible. So there we go. For a century or more, people worried that aliens might leave their own planet and come and conquer ours. This fear spawned a series of elaborate conspiracy theories, some involving the military, some involving a government cover-up. It was even argued that the aliens had bred with humans and sent secret messages to each other. Now it turns out the effort of investigating all those conspiracies has been a total waste of time. For planet Earth and everything on it, and indeed everything in the whole of our reality, could be just a product of an alien computer game. They didn't need to travel here to take us over. They got us to travel to them. So smile. Because somewhere in another galaxy, something is watching you.